what was the um, what was the reaction to the film? Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, well, what happened next was, and this wasn't uh, in the film because, you know, I do like to take the viewer behind the scenes a little bit to see how you're making the film, um, especially now in this kind of pro post-truth environment. People don't trust the media, so it's important um, to show the process and not just the message, you know. Um, but sometimes there are certain things that distract from the whole point of the film. So, for example, there was, uh, after the last sequence of that film, um, or I suppose during the filming of the last sequence of the film, where, where I was doing the telephone conversation with Bato Dambayev and setting up the VK account, um, the FSB were also visiting the hotel and interviewing me and questioning me and asking about what I was doing there. And so the night after that interview, um, we got really paranoid that they were going to take uh, all of our footage away from us. Um, so we made sure to try to upload overnight everything that we had on us uh, to New York, uh, which we did, and it took us all night. And, and, and then we sort of shredded all of our SIM cards in a... In and a, that was before you made the phone call, or...? After I made the you, phone after call. After you made the because phone call. Because once I made the phone call, I had sort of announced my presence to them, you know, to him. Although I'd spoken to his wife already, and she probably phoned him, um, but uh, once I'd, I'd phoned him, you know, it was clear that we were in town, and we were sort of we've shown all our cards. Um, so we destroyed any documents we had linking us to Ukraine. Like I had an accreditation card from Ukraine, which I cut up with scissors and flushed down the toilet, um, and you know, phone SIM cards and stuff like that, and then. Um, we didn't sleep all night, so we could see that there was a car standing outside of the front of the hotel, out of the window, um, all night. And then when we ordered a taxi to the airport to leave, um, that car followed us. And when we got to the airport, all of our things were searched very thoroughly, um, and uh, it was clear that they knew exactly who we were and what we were doing, because they were asking questions about whether we had been carrying out journalism activities, as they put it. Um, and they almost didn't want to let us onto the plane without me signing a confession that I had been carrying out journalism activities. Um, but I realized that it was a bluff because I think the local security for forces wanted to be rid of me as much as I wanted to be gone. Um, so that was what happened immediately uh, as in, the, in, in the last part of filming. And um, in terms of sort of wider implications, what was the reaction to the film from the both the viewers as well as the Russian government? Well, it was obviously really heavily trolled online by anonymous sort of pro-Kremlin bots. Um, but the Russian government, I think, quite wisely didn't react to it at all um, because they didn't want to draw more attention to it through their reaction. Because at the time, you know, I think right now it's taken as... Uh, uh, common knowledge that Russia was involved in the war in eastern Ukraine. And at, but at that time, um, the, the Russians were very, very careful uh, about, um, you know, treading a very fine line in terms of recognizing that that was going on. And so I think they wanted to draw as little attention to it as possible. The, the only thing that happened to me was that the next time that I applied for a journalist press visa to Russia, it wasn't issued. It wasn't denied, but it wasn't issued either. You know, the, the, the Russians are very yeah. good at um, dragging out the bureaucratic process for such a long time um, that eventually you, gave, you give up. But I, I never gave up. They just sent me an email uh, that said that your visa can't be issued at this time. Uh, a reason will be given at Next some time. point in the future. And, you know, that reason never came. I vaguely remember that there was a, um, I think I was the, after the film that they banned, or there was at least a rumor that the Russian soldiers were then banned from posting of contacts um, and on social media platforms. I think general. the Russian soldiers were banned from posting from the very beginning, you know. Um, but what people don't think about or don't realize is that most soldiers are like 18, 19, 20 year old kids, essentially. So um, if they can get their hands on a device that will allow them to log into social media, they're going to do it. These aren't, you know, highly trained spies. These are grunts. They're just regular soldiers. So they're not trained to operate in a secret environment. And that was what was so interesting about 
this war was that they were using uh, regular troops um, to do sort of a covert mission. And that's why there was so many leaks of information and, and why the operation was so obvious. And I, I don't know, it's kind of like a, it was kind of a quantum operation in a sense, you know, like Schrodinger's cat, because at the same time it was a Russian operation as it wasn't a Russian operation, you know? Um, and, and everybody knew that it wasn't, it wasn't at the same time. And it was all about plausible deniability. It wasn't so much about making sure that no information got out about Russia's involvement. It was about giving them enough narrative space to claim that perhaps they weren't involved. That was the real mission. It wasn't, you know, complete top secrecy. Um, the, uh, the very nature of the investigation is obviously very different from what we could do even, you know, three, four, five years ago. The whole concept of open source yeah. and so on. So for you, I mean, you mentioned Elliot Higgins in the, in the piece and he was clearly, you know, played a very important role in making this whole thing happen. Um, happened. But um, f for you doing this, I think for the first time, right? This was the first time you did open source investigation. What was, what was it like? Were you surprised by the fact that you, were, you managed to track him, track Bato down? To well, what did you expect? What was your expectation when you set out? What was your best case scenario? I, you know, I would have, uh, the best case scenario, I would have met him in the flesh and interviewed him and confronted him. Um, but I guess I got second base best scenario in terms of I actually found out that he was a living, breathing human being and not just a bunch of pixels that I'd seen on a screen somewhere. Because um, that's the problem with so much of the information that you get over social media is that it's unverified and you never know uh, whether the person who's posting has a vested interest in posting it. Um, so, you know, I spent a several days looking for the right candidate. Um, the reason I was able to find uh, Bato Dambayev, that soldier in particular, was uh, because of a publication in Novoya Gazeta in February. Um, where the journalist interviewed an injured soldier from Buryatia um, in hospital. And, you know, reading this article, that soldier gives away a lot of information about where he came from and how he was ordered to come to Ukraine and which unit he was in. And it seems, and he was, he was a burn victim. And it seems like, um, you know, he was probably under the influence of a lot of morphine or something. Because he was free speaking so freely, it was incredible. Sorry, i got to turn off my phone. Um, and uh, this guy basically spilled the beans and told me which units I needed to be looking in. And the good thing about the uh, Vkontakte, this social network, uh, in Russia, very popular in Russia, is that, um, you know, just like on Facebook, you put in uh, where you work and where you went to school. In Russia, because there's a required military service, you also put in what military unit you served in, so that you can find your friends who also served in that military unit. So, since I knew what unit he was, you know, this, since I knew that a particular unit had been involved, from this Novoya Gazeta publication, I could then just go into Vkontakte and find all the servicemen who had served in that unit and start looking at their profiles to see if they'd been posting pictures that looked like they may, be, may have been taken in Ukraine. So that's how you found him? Yeah, so I looked through several hundred profiles of uh, soldiers who um, came from two particular units in Buryatia, one in the capital and one on the Mongolian border. and. Uh, I was looking for some very specific um, characteristics. I needed not just a guy who had been taking pictures from, that looked like they had been from Ukraine, but I needed a guy who had taken a picture of himself where his face was visible, where it looked like he was in an area that I could then go and identify. So, you know, there were plenty of other soldiers who had been posting pictures of Ukraine, but very few of them were stupid enough to post pictures with their own face. Um, in Ukraine. So once I had identified him, that's when Bellingcat came in. I sent the pictures. Oh, that so that you identified him before the Bellingcat. Yeah. Right. And then, then we shared, we were sharing information. Right. We were kind of doing it together um, to some respect. But the soldier I found myself. 
And then I sent all of the photographs to Bellingcat, and what Bellingcat are excellent at doing is uh, identifying, geolocating as they call it, or identifying um, the location where a photograph or a video that was posted on the internet was taken. And so uh, once we decided that this guy was going to be our target, um, we went through the process of finding out where all the pictures were made, and then I tracked the pictures as you saw in the film. Um, so for journalists watching this, what would you say um, were the lessons that you learned from doing an open source investigation? And are, are there things that um, reporters, journalists should be using more of that um, in, in more of even everyday life work? Yeah, I think everybody already knows that you can get a ton of information, personal information on people from the internet. I mean, I, I don't think that's going to be a, a big surprise to anyone at this stage already. Um, but, you know, what do you do, for example, when a public figure uh, isn't on social media, like a minister? Or, you know, some ministers have their social media accounts run by media professionals, or, or a big businessman, or an oligarch, or something like that. Somebody who's perhaps, you know, in the age group when they're just not that active on social media. You know, people who are 40, 50, 60 years old who are in positions of power in your country. Um, one thing you might not think to do would be to follow the social media accounts of their children, or follow the social media accounts of their wives. The Navalny, um, his anti-corruption bureau, did a really interesting investigation. I think it was the deputy prime minister. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was yeah. which official it was, but it was a top official, and uh, they discovered that um, his wife had been ferrying, ferrying her prize-winning dogs around the European continent, taking them to dog shows um, on private jets, and spent about six hundred thousand dollars to do it. Um, and they found out from her Instagram account. Her husband was a powerful man, but she viewed herself as a private citizen who could just, you know, advertise and brag these things. But, you know, even that's not enough for an investigation because even everything that you can, you can sort of uh, pull out of the internet, you have to follow up with actual journalism, investigative journalism school, skills. Because how did they found, find out that it was $600,000 worth of uh, private jet? They had to corroborate the flight records with all of the dog shows to find out, um, you know, when the pl plane took off, when it landed, uh, how much the particular private jet companies charged for their services, and so on. So it was like a, a lot of work. Um, but the first clue came from Instagram, from social media. So it's a it's a good way to find find out about stories. But I think if you just sort of if you just took the picture from Instagram of the wife with the dog and then did a short post that said something like, hey, wife of this guy is spending a lot of money, I think it would just fall into a black hole. But if you then, you know, it, maybe it would be popular for a day. Maybe it'd go viral for a day even, but it wouldn't have a lasting effect. Then if you go and then you follow it up with the actual uh, journalistic footwork and uh, get all of the facts behind it, find out how much money was spent, and find out how wide reaching the issue actually was, um, then I think it has uh, much longer legs, that story, and, and lives a longer life. And, you know, and that's why I'm talking about it today, because it made an impact, and I remember it. And, um, and do you think as we become smarter at looking at various um, bits of information online, um, those who we are trying to investigate are becoming smarter as well, um, uh, and better at hiding that information? And would you say there is kind of evidence of that? Well, it's sort of an a, a arms race of who's going to outsmart who, you know, the corrupt officials or the uh, clever journalists. And, and how are we doing? <laughs> I mean, judging by the state of the world today, not very well. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it's just like with policing. Police don't catch every criminal, but they have presence on the street. And when you see a police officer, you behave in a different way. And I think the same goes for journalism. You're not going to be able to expose every single corrupt official. But if you expose one or two corrupt officials, maybe you scare the others uh, into lying or behaving a bit better, or at least being more careful. Um, <laughs> so I think you know, the work that we do is meaningful, even if we're not able to get uh, all of the bad guys fired or put in prison. 
Um, as, as a sort of a follow-up to that and uh, a follow-up to the thought in your film uh, towards the end where you say that, you know, it's, it's impossible to keep things secret anymore. Um, and that, that's very much true, but increasingly it also, you know, things are not secret, but the truth also seems to matter less and less as we, you know, post-truth is the new a big new word in Oxford Dictionary and um, you know the post-factual world is the new big thing and so on so um, and you partially addressed it but like you know is that um, I hear a lot of journalists asking a question like uh, what should drive us these days when we do these investigations that don't matter same Elliot Higgins who came up with incredible amounts of evidence of MH17 being brought down by a Russian book missile, and yet Russians are dismissing all this evidence as, as a lie. Like in that environment where truth seems to matter less and less, where do journalists kind of get their... Um, w w what should keep us going? Well, I think we have to sort of buckle down and do the work. You know, you just have to keep slogging on. It's... You know, what's more, not m perhaps as troubling for me right now is the proliferation of opinion pieces on social media. It really makes me angry that most of what people read today isn't actual reporting. It's uh, somebody sitting in an office or at their desk at home um, interpreting everything else that they've read online and making a prediction about the future. That's not what reporting is about. And the problem is uh, the way our Facebook... Um, uh, is tuned to give us what we like. When you're writing an opinion piece, you can predict you know, the most fantastical outcomes and the most fantastical results of whatever is going on today, and you can write it in those terms, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't matter, but it's going to be interesting, and people are going to click on it and like it and be like, yeah, right on. That's exactly what's going to happen if these fascists come to power. You know, we got to stop it. And, the, and it gets shared and it goes around, but it's not necessarily based on a journalist going somewhere, talking to somebody, establishing that an event has happened, and just giving you the dry facts. It used to be that you would open a newspaper and it would have a bunch of reports from all over the world and there would be two pages, maximum four pages of opinion in a newspaper that was 26 pages long, you know? Today, all you're seeing on your Facebook feed, pretty much, primarily, is people's opinions. And uh, so people are very divorced from the reality of what is actually taking place. And uh, this pressure that's now being put on Facebook about fake news, I think that's very good. And I think Facebook definitely realizes that there is a problem. And even though that they, they deny that they're part of the problem, that's the public um, you know, of it. That's their no. That's their public uh, face. You know, that's what no. they're putting out. But they realize that there's something going on, um, and that they need to. That you know, they're responsible for uh, this atomization of society, where people silo themselves into groups uh, that uh, agree with each other. You know, I, we were just talking the other day. Like right now, I would prefer to go work for an organization like Fox News that has an audience that I never speak to than to go work for NPR where I'll just be preaching to the choir and uh, I'll, I'll be telling people things that they already agree with and we won't be changing anyone's mind about anything. And do you Russia think... Russia Today, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Russia Today is a bit beyond the pale. You need a little bit of plastic operation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they might not take what is, what is she trying to say? Oh, yeah, yeah. Before, yeah. yeah. It's an insult wrapped in a comment, but basically. Then, uh, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> clearly. Yeah, More job, opinion. You know? More opinion. <laughs> Um, Do you hear what I'm saying about I hear opinion what you're saying. proliferating I hear rather your than opinion. actual yeah. dry level yeah. added reporting? Yeah. And do you think that applies to the region? I mean, you, I mean, obviously, you know, most people who will be watching this um, are in Georgia, from Georgia, uh, but also, you know, so you might not be very familiar with uh, the media environment here, but if you, when you look at Russia, when you look at Ukraine, Again, very different kind of universes yeah, when it yeah. comes to media environment. But do you think to an extent that applies to journalists working in those countries as well? I mean, I, I don't think Russia and Ukraine 
um, in terms of Facebook penetration are any different than the United States. Although in Russia it's VK rather than Facebook, but it's the same principle, you know? The algorithms are attuned to give you what you want to see, not information that you might disagree with or might open your mind to something else. So, um, so that was, you know, you had good advice for journalists. What would be your advice for the audiences, for, for consumers, as consumers of news? What do you think we should be doing more of? There, I think there needs to be a higher level of awareness of how journalism works because in schools, you know, we teach all kinds of subjects. In America, at least, they teach you government and how there's, you know, three different branches of government. And they also uh, talk about the fourth estate and how journalism is also, you know, another check on government that balances their power. Um, but I think we need to start educating uh, the public more about how to separate real journalism from fake journalism. And it, it's not about uh, whether the journalism is biased to the left or to the right. For me, it's all about sourcing. If you're reading something and the sourcing is clear, then you're dealing with journalism. If you know where the information comes from, if the journalist is presenting all of the facts that are listed in the story as coming from somewhere else, and then you can follow up on that somewhere else and find out where it came from, then you know you're dealing with you know, a proper journalistic product. But if you're reading a website that you've never heard of before, but it popped up in your Facebook um, feed, and then you go through it, and it's just a bunch of statements that aren't sourced to anywhere else, then you know that's fake. And I think it's surprising to me, and it's surprising to a lot of journalists, um, how low uh, people's level of, uh, how, low, how unable people are to differentiate the two. People don't real, for us, sourcing is second nature. Finding out where the information came from is, uh, is just part of the job. Um, how, how long did it take you from the beginning to the end? Uh, two months? Three months? This one, three months, roughly. Three months, yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, I so, wasn't working consistently for three months on sure. this thing. But. So this is like three months um, of, you know, as you say, following the digital breadcrumbs and like picking them up along the way and basically following this one guy, right? It's all about you and this one guy. Yeah. What was... Um, oh, how did your relationship with him develop over time as you followed him? And what was it like to finally get him on the phone? I was so nervous that he was going to put the phone down at any moment and that I wasn't going to get enough. You know, I was, I was already devastated um, because I knew once I'd spoken to his wife that I had kind of already shown my cards. And I was basically hoping that he would be at home asleep with his wife. That scene was filmed at 7 o'clock in the morning. We came as early as possible um, to increase our chances of him being at home. I mean, I'm not 100% sure. Potentially. Um, but, you know, I, I thought we'd catch them off guard. There'd be, they'd be too sleepy to think things through properly. You come and, like, is this guy home? You know, he shows up and boom, you're done. But I managed to get his phone number from her, so... Did you feel bad for him at any point? You know, what they were doing was completely illegal. And what I was doing was in the public interest. You know, but from the Russian government's own perspective, sending the military into a foreign country uh, it, without uh, approval from the Federation Council is against the law. Totally against the law. Um, and that's what they did. And so the soldiers who went in and followed those orders were following illegal orders. Um, and, I, and I thought it was much more important for the public to know that that was happening and it was coming straight from the top um, than you know, d the discomfort that uh, this particular soldier experienced. Does he know that he's a star now? Well, if you film? can track him down, maybe he'll tell you. So did, <laughs> did he close his... Did he close his account? Um, yeah, he's, uh, they've obviously wiped um, his online presence as much as possible. Yeah. So uh, does anybody else have yeah, any do questions? Yeah, do you have any questions? Did they wipe your account? My VK account? Yeah. No, I, I did that myself. <laughs> Do you know what happened to him? I don't know.
don't know anything about him. I know that he called the security services Simon, on me, real? so I don't have very much exist? sympathy for him. <laughs> Were you surprised that he actually called you back? I mean, wasn't, was it, wasn't it more logical for him just to not respond at all anymore? No, you called him oh, back. He called, back, he called, back, he right? called no, he no. called him. You called him again. You called him for a second time. Well, there time. were several phone calls. I, I, Did he pick up each time? In the film, there are two <laughs> phone calls. You make the ma the phone call, and then once you see that he's been on the page, you make another phone call, right? Or did he yeah, call so you? It was second phone call I, from you to him, yeah? In I don't remember exactly the chronology, but I think what happened was I called him, and I told him to look at the VK page, yeah. and yeah. then, like, half an hour later, either I called him back or he called me back. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, he was curious enough about what was happening. I don't think he realized that it was a big TV investigation. Um, and maybe his uh, superior officers told him to keep me on the line so that they could investigate what I was about. So that's a possibility, too. So that worked in my favor. Did you feel like when, because you clearly were trolled probably all the way through your coverage of Ukraine, but did you felt that there was a peak or some kind of different tone after that film became internationally shown known? Did you, did you heard any, did you felt any difference in Troy? To be honest, I think my Russian roulette series, which was 110 episodes yeah. long and had like 36 million views overall, had a lot more impact than this one film. Because this was a part of the whole. This wasn't part of. This was a separate no. documentary. Ah, not part of the Russian roulette. No, but Russian Roulette was a sort of a series. So yeah. for those of you who aren't familiar, we did a series of coverage of Ukraine called Russian Roulette, and it had 111 episodes, I think. So, um, you know, I think the trolls sort of cottoned on to who I was through that more than anything. And what do you think um, pissed them off throughout that, what, two years? You started with Crimea, right? And then went on for two years. You did Russian Roulette for two years. Yeah. Of all the pieces, of all the 110, which was there a particular one that had the most impact that you, they hated you for the most? I think that the... Pissed them off the most? You know, I can't speak to that, but I think that the episodes that were most popular and most successful were the ones that happened at the very beginning, when Russia's intervention abroad was a very new and surprising thing, and everybody was trying to just figure out what was going on. You know, me the first among them. And I think that came across in the uh, reports from Crimea, was that we were just trying to find out what was happening, and it was so mind-blowing what was actually going on um, that uh, it, it proved to be very popular. So, um, you know, if we did any kind of a service with those, with those Russian roulette episodes, it was by showing um, you know, how Russia operated on the ground um, in this uh, hybrid war uh, environment that you know, people hadn't even termed yet. Um, Simon, you said that uh, people don't trust the media anymore. What is your experience of that? You, 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 was a comment made. Well, people never liked the media, and, I, and I've always been fine with that, because we're not doing the job to, you know, be liked by the people we're exposing. Obviously, if you're going to go and say somebody's doing something bad, they're going to not like you. So that's something that you've had to contend with as a journalist for a very long time. And it's just a fact of life, to be unliked. Oh, so it's not like you've noticed in your, throughout your coverage in Ukraine that people are just like fed up? No, but I, I think there has been like a qualitative change. Now, not only are we not liked, but we're also not believed. And that's the worst part about it. Because at least before, um, people trusted in what we were doing. And now the informational environment has become so clouded and so muddied by um, people who aren't acting in goodwill but who are purposefully trying to uh, disinform the public um, that, that all journalists get painted with the same brush. But you know there's a silver lining in that I think um, that the public is probably going to try to come back to and follow the journalists that they do trust uh, and, and hopefully um, people who have credibility and who have a reputation will be able to continue to perform um, their job and, and, and uh, be believed. Um, it's kind of like with you know, music. Now that music is basically free to get from anywhere online, um, musicians have to do public concerts to make money again. 
and I, maybe journalism is going to be the same in that you know you'll have to attach your name to every word you say and be credible um, in order to have the public's trust. So the whole fake news thing may be a good thing after all. Hopefully. <laughs> Any more questions? I have some, but I will. Yeah. Sure. Why do you think that what what is happening now of going into a journalist not being uh, believed and not being uh, credible anymore or not being uh, trusted? Why do you see that changing? You mentioned Facebook also, who has a, something that they could do, but. Why do you think that this would actually change? I mean, I'm, I'm saying that there's just so much information being put into the, into the market um, and uh, people are being told that it's not true and um, a lot of it isn't true, that they're losing their trust in uh, you know, media products that they see as a whole. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, yes, there's good journalism out there, but there's also a lot of bad journalism out there, and people know that there's bad journalism out there, and they're not quite able to tell the difference between the two. Do they care? No. I mean, I, I guess that depends on the, on the individual. Do you care? Well, I, I do, that's why I'm here, but, but when, when you see the results of, of recent elections or, or uh, in the world, it means that people don't actually care because they can't know whether it's true or not. So then it's about feelings rather than facts. And so why would that change? Or why would well, people then start trusting you uh, again? I think you know opinions and mass behavior swings like a pendulum, just like elections. You know, Donald Trump is the, he's not just Donald Trump and a guy who rode in on this wave of uh, post-truth. He's also the polar opposite of Obama. And the reason he um, was able to find a path to victory was because so many people were fed up with Obama over the last eight years. So, you know, I'm trying to be an optimist and I think that four years from now or eight years from now, the pendulum is going to sweep in the opposite direction. And the same goes for the popularity of fake news. You know, right now people are tired of the so-called mainstream media. Um, but once they get tired of everything else, they'll come back to it. Uh, I think these, these things are cyclical. Well, here's, I've got a question. I, yeah, you say people are tired of the mainstream media, but the New York Times, um, which is probably one of the kings of the mainstream media, has uh, put on massive numbers of subscribers since, the, um, since Trump's victory. That's awesome. Yeah. And who, though, my question really is, uh, who do you think actually is managing right now to navigate? Who's going to get right? I think... I think plenty of you know, mainstream media outlets are getting it right. And the difference between um, you know, a good media and a bad media isn't that the good media never get a story wrong. It's that when they do get a story wrong, they come out and admit it and they issue a correct, correction. Just like the difference between a corrupt country um, you know, like Russia and a less corrupt country like America, isn't that there's no corruption in America, it's that when they catch somebody who's corrupt, he goes to jail. Um, so I think, you know, we need to keep, we need to follow the organizations who have credibility, and you get credibility not just by being right every time, but when you're wrong by admitting it. So if, if, if uh, you know, if you were reading Breitbart, or I don't know how it's pronounced, Breitbart, um, have they ever issued a factual correction in their entire existence? I don't think so that should tell you something about them. I don't mind that you know, there are publications out there that are more right-leaning or more left-leaning. That's totally fine. Um, but uh, you, know, you have to stand by what you say, and when you, have, when you get things wrong, you have to raise your hand about it. And that's actually a strength, not a weakness. I mean, you worked for um, how, how, how many years? Four years for an organization that didn't come out, wasn't is not quite mainstream today either, but um, was doing things in a different way. Uh, Vice News. Uh, what do you guys? What do you think you guys got right? Like, what was it about? What do you think? I mean, apart from the, the entire business model and so on, what was it about Vice journalism that people that made it work for people that people responded to? You know, I think we tried to step away from the kind of uh, traditional news broadcast, and so it had a fresh feel. Um, we were very light on voiceovers, um, so that's a stylistic difference. 
uh, in my reports at least I tried to say most of what I wanted to say on camera while things were happening instead of going back and writing a script later um, that felt sort of like the voice of God telling you what you need to think. I think we tried to let our viewers know that we were trying to figure things out too, that we didn't know everything um, and we were uh, on a journey, on an investigation um, trying to find up and down. Um, and I, I think that came across as honest and real, and I think that's part of the reason. And many tried to copy it. And, and many tried to copy it. Natalia. I have, I have to tell the story of, um, I got a phone call, so we were covering the war in Ukraine at the same time. At, before one of my trips, I got a phone call from the, I was covering the, um, for the BBC, and I got a phone call from one of the very senior editors at the BBC, who said, sounded a little awkward and it took a really long time to basically say it but kept saying you know Natalia it would be really great if you could you know instead of doing the normal packages if you could just like maybe try to do something a little more dynamic maybe where you sort of go out in a different and after after about sort of a couple of minutes of her not quite saying it I said to her would you want me to be more like Vice News and she's like yes exactly <laughs> so I had to copy Ostrovsky you did a pretty good job yeah, thank yeah. you thank you this is um, if it's time I mean it's more of a sort of philosophical question about our obsession with emotional response to articles why we care so much about opinion why we click on opinion and uh, why we are drifting away from fact based arguments because it's more exciting right but we also have the technology that allows us to just feast on that so so in a way there's kind of like a, a, a kind of crossing or meeting of these two phenomena where we have the emotional almost now ascendant and the technology that allows us to just tune in what we want and that makes me skeptical that we're going to be able to escape from this um, but you, you you have some grounds for optimism you think the pendulum will swing back well i mean i think the first uh, step to fixing a problem is recognizing that you have one and we've definitely <coughs> done that um so that's why i'm optimistic is that you know there's a lot of a lot of realization now among even consumers of news that this is a problem and some people have sort of dallied into trying to find out what the other side is thinking and um, going out of their way to find articles that they wouldn't necessarily read. And the Washington Post did that famous, I think, Red Feed, Blue Feed project, which is a, a page on the Washington Post website that still exists right now. You can go visit it where you can click on the red feed and see what people who support the Republicans are seeing right now for the most part. And you can click on the blue feed you know, and see what the Democrats are looking at. So obviously this isn't going to solve the problem because you go onto that feed once and then you never go on to it again. But the fact that there's a recognition um, that this is a problem means that people are going to start looking for solutions. I think we, have, um, maybe we should be more depressed and instead of like 10 Marys or like uh, the Holy Father, they have to switch their Facebook account into the, some kind of opposite type of profile thinking for one week. <laughs> Just Sounds like know. torture, but okay. Yeah, that's what like. That's supposed to be the proper punishment, you know. Well, your account was attracted or tampered with in any way after this, or that we followed in any way that you know Um, When I was kidnapped, my computer was taken from me. Yeah, I've seen that episode, yeah. And, uh, it was hacked into. I had like a six digit um, password for getting into my computer, not into my Gmail, thankfully. But my Facebook was open on my computer when they, when they managed to crack the password. So they posted a picture of a half-naked girl, and that luckily was the worst thing that happened to me. How imagine in character. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do, do you want to talk a little bit about the kidnapping? I'm sure many people... Well, I mean... I would just recommend to people to have really strong passwords um, and to use two-step verification, if you know that, what that is. Basically, uh, you know, there's the base level of security and then you can add another level of security on everything, on, on Gmail, on Facebook, on Twitter, on all those important ones. And I think it's worth your time to invest in having that, even though it takes a little bit longer to log into all of your... Um, 
into your accounts, but I think it's really worthwhile. And also, if you ever, ever, ever get an email that says that we think your account has been hacked into, it's time to change your password, do not click on that link, because that's how they get you. That's how they got John Podesta, and that's how they got probably most of the Democratic National Convention emails. It was simply through phishing scams like that. It wasn't um, highly sophisticated cyber attacks of any kind. If you want to change your password, always do it through your own volition by going through the settings on your website. Don't click through on links on dodgy emails that look like they're from Google. Did you thought when you said when you're covering this Fabiaris, did you felt that, okay, it can happen to me, I can end up in this basement, because by that time, you're covering, there were people there already, yeah? You're not the first person. I think we should fill people in. So Simon was oh. kidnapped in 2014, 2015? 2014. In 2014, in Slavyansk, uh, when it was um, still under the control of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic. So he was held up at the checkpoint, and they had your photograph, I think, right? They were yeah, they were, look, they were looking, they were for, looking me. for you. Yeah. I, I was held for three days, and you know my story um, isn't exceptional. There was uh, thousands of people who got uh, kidnapped and held in basements all across eastern Ukraine over the course of the war there. And there were some Ukrainian... Um, journalists and citizen journalists who were always already in the basement um, that I was thrown into mm -hmm. and they were held there for weeks and I was there for three days because there was a lot of public outcry uh, over my case because all of my colleagues in journalism really stood up for me and I'm really grateful to them and Natalia was among them she was in the hotel where my crew was um, fighting every day to make sure that the world knew um, so that I could get out. And so I did get out uh, three days later. Uh, but I, I can't remember where I'm Christina going Christina had this. a question no, about it. Was like, you, know, you knew there are people in the basement already. Would you think it could happen to you? Or you just, when you're going to get to know everybody, you feel like, you know, like that you can always talk your way out from these problems? Um, Were you surprised? You know, if I, th if I thought that it was coming, then I probably would have left because I'm not, I don't, I, don't, I don't try to take risks just for the sake of taking risks. You take risks because there's a payoff at the end, but if the risk is too high, then you just don't go through with it. There's no reason. So if I had any inkling of a suspicion that they were out to get me and that they were looking for me, I definitely wouldn't have been driving through checkpoints that night, you know? Great. So what about people fighting there? Do they have this kind of uniform ideology or there is some kind of inner conflict between Russian nationalists? I understand. I think the biggest mistake to make is to um, assume that, you know, people who are out there fighting don't believe in anything and are just doing things because they're being paid money. I think uh, being paid money is... Uh, uh, enabling factor uh, which definitely motivates people who hold certain beliefs um, to, to realize them. Um, so you have to, you definitely have to take people seriously. And, and yes, you're right, you know, in eastern Ukraine there are people fighting on the pro-Russian side who have diametrically opposite ideologies. Some of them are national Bolsheviks and some of them are, um, you know, monarchists and some of them are, you know, communists or whatever you want. Um, but, you know, in 2011, when people were protesting against Vladimir Putin in the streets of Moscow, that was a movement that united uh, nationalists and liberals who, had, who shared a goal uh, of overthrowing Putin. So I don't think it's extraordinary that you have uh, different groups fighting against what they perceive to be a common enemy. And I think the war in Ukraine was a very uh, interesting way for Vladimir Putin to play uh, internal opposition against him, off against each, yeah. themselves, because it was supported by the nationalists uh, and it wasn't supported by the liberals and basically he broke up uh, the, uh, the opposition movement um, by making that move. Um, I actually have one last question, if it's okay. Oh, there are two more. Um, let me ask this and then if uh, Nino allows us one more question. We'll 
one more question, but uh, I want to ask you, um, the war, um, I noticed even you referred to the war in Ukraine in the past tense, um, and it seems to be kind of a default thing for so many people now, even though the war in Ukraine, it, it's not was, it is, right? It's still going well, on. Well, I'm currently unemployed, so I'm not covering it. <laughs> um, so yeah. for me, it is in but, the past tense. Um, in, in general, uh, yeah, it was an attack on you. <laughs> but in general, are you, um, you know, you rarely see, um, see it in the headlines these days. And is that something that concerns you, the fact that? It's not in the news anymore, or is it? Should it be in the news more? Well, look. I mean, there's a genocide, or at least a massacre of an immense scale happening right now in the city of Aleppo in Syria, and I think the media is rightly focusing on that. And in Ukraine, um, the status quo hasn't really shifted since September of 2016, at least. Um, so there's not really that much news coming out of eastern Ukraine. If the situation change there dramatically, then I think uh, journalists would be reporting it, but it's not. Yeah, so last, last question. question. You partly answered it because you said that you were unemployed. I wanted to ask what you're, what you're currently doing and also if you could tell a little bit more about your ambition or aspiration for the next period of time. Which, uh, mm -hmm. You're a journalist who sh shows like new series have been watched more than 36 million times. My primary ambition is to find a job right now. <laughs> <laughs> so if there are any job offers out there, I'm, I'm open to them.